Um, my name's Ike Kang. I'm Deputy Director and Chief Curator here at the museum, and this is Art Matters. And um, hopefully you were able to catch last week's lecture with our speaker, Jan Ludovic, who is still with us for an additional lecture, this time devoted to an area which is a, his original uh, specialization, which is African art. Um, Last week, he gave us an overview of an exhibition that they're enjoying at the Minneapolis Institute of Fine Arts, where he's been curator of the arts of Africa for the last 10 years. Um, but this week, I think uh, we'll really get a completely different side of things from him, and he's engaging in a really uh, pressing issue for many of us in the art world having to deal with cultural patrimony. Um, and as you know, most famously, as embodied by the fate of the Elgin Marbles, for example, antiquities have been in the news a lot, but a lot of uh, non-Western art from different areas of the world have now become points of contestation. And as you know, many things are now questioned in terms of the legitimacy of whether or not they belong in art museums or should be returned to their countries of origin. So that's the gist, I believe, of the lecture that he'll deliver today. This is actually a new lecture for him. And I know he's looking forward to your always intelligent feedback. We'll have questions at the end. So please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming here. Um, thank you, I can't, for the invitation, both last week and this week. Uh, this week's lecture was not canceled, so I think I may have done a good job last week. <laughs> and I also wanted to thank Michelle West for the logistics of this trip. So I think the original title I had given was Protecting Ancient Art from Africa, but I want to open it up to Africa's cultural heritage more generally. And it's quite a, a topical issue because less than two weeks ago, um, the report that was ordered by the French president came out um, about, about colonial art in French museums. But I want to start with this uh, still from a movie, a recent movie, Black Panther, uh, showing um, Eric Killmonger, who visits a museum that very much looks like the British Museum, but it's called the Museum of Great Britain. And in fact, it's kind of a hilarious scene afterwards because the, he has an appointment with the curator who comes into the gallery with a cup of coffee, which of course no curator would ever do. <laughs> But um, he raises an important question about the uh, origin of art on view there and the restitution. And so here are the two authors, um, the Senegalese um, scholar and writer Fervin Sarr and the French art historian Benedict Savoie, Savoy, who uh, were commissioned to write a report six months ago. And that report, as I said, just came out at the end of last month. And um, one of the recommendations is to change French law, allowing for the return or restitution or rep repatriation of African cultural heritage. And in particular, royal art from uh, the kingdom of Dahomey, which is in the country of Benin. But they, in general, uh, also recommend uh, more transparency in the museum world about the origin of works of art. And in their report has already had a number of consequences in these past 10 days. Uh, there have been protests at the Brooklyn Museum in New York, at the um, RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design, where um, people have re requested the direction of the museums to uh, take into account uh, the looting of uh, art from the Benin Kingdom in particular, and I will talk about that in a minute. And for instance, um, I mentioned that uh, the museum near Brussels, the Museum of Tervuren, uh, has about 180,000 objects from Africa. Uh, many, I must say, are not works of art, but they're uh, 
ten thousands of spears and arrows at that museum. Um, but at any rate, that museum will reopen after a f complete overhaul that lasted for five years. It will reopen this weekend, this coming weekend. And the king of Belgium decided not to attend the opening because of the uh, controversy um, around the origin of the art there. Of course, his great uncle or great great uncle was Leopold II, who has a, a bad reputation, as you know. So, in this um, overview, and it's such a huge topic that I cannot do justice to it, um, I would like to give a few examples, often also given, taking as um, as objects, uh, holdings that we have at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. So I will start with uh, memorial posts from Kenya, and then uh, talk about archaeological material and war booty. And all these different cases, of course, uh, require uh, different approaches and um, research also. Um, I arrived at the Minneapolis Institute of Art 10 years ago, in 2008, and um, my first show was called I Africa Connecting with Sub-Saharan Art. And the little I um, had to do with new technology that was tested out. There was a, uh, an app for iPhones or iPads that allowed visitors to play a particular instrument that was on view. And uh, there were other interactives in the exhibition, a small show as you see. And the entire exhibition was really organized around five questions. Um, why, what makes it beautiful? How was it used? How old is it? How does it feel, sound, or smell? And how did it get here? And so, of course, that question, how did it get here, um, is about provenance. And the small section about uh, how did it get here is visible on the right hand uh, of, of the screen. Uh, the two posts against the wall that we will see in, in a minute in detail, uh, post figures. And then against the wall on the right is a, a headless terracotta figure that comes from Nigeria, from the Nok culture. And we'll talk about that too. Um, I used color coding to address these questions on the labels. It was kind of a, a test run for a major reinstallation of the African art galleries that we did at the at MIA, and that opened in 2013. Um, so I tested out several ideas and and approaches, and the color coding didn't work at all. So that's something that I dropped. Um, and so here you have two um, memorial posts that uh, from Kenya, from the Mijikenda people who live along the coast of, of Kenya, along the Indian Ocean coast. And they are not um, grave markers, but they are memorial posts that commemorate um, ancestors. And really they are considered to be um, spirit markers, which are carved and installed to solve a, a particular problem in a family or in the community after uh, having consulted a healer uh, and diviner through divination a certain uh, spirit has been or ancestor has been identified as the cause of the issue and then such a memorial post is built and um, and so the question I asked, how did it get here? And um, I wrote a label for that, um, for those posts. Um, and I will read the end of the label. In recent years, debate has arisen about the movement of these pieces of cultural heritage. And a few posts have been returned to their rightful owners. And then I was asked by my supervisors to add a more, one more sentence. However, when the original location of memorial posts is not documented, it is difficult for a museum to repatriate such a post. So that was a, a sentence of caution. But um, the whole issue really started of repatriation started with an article that was published in 2003 uh, by a number of anthropologists. 
about the transatlantic trade in Afri African ancestors, specifically about these uh, Vigango, as they are called, these memorial posts. And in the article, uh, there's this photograph on the right, which shows on the left a field photo from the 1950s of uh, a Mijikenda elder with two memorial markers uh, posts be behind him. And those two um, have been identified by the anthropologists who had done field work um, in this region, had been identified and um, it, it became clear that they were now in this, these two museums, the Illinois State Museum and the Hampton University Museum. Indeed, there had been uh, enormous trade in these memorial posts in the 80s and 90s. Hundreds of them were, had been kind of taken away from uh, villages, basically stolen by uh, local um, runners and then sold uh, in the city of Mombasa, which is a, a major port city on the coast of Kenya. And most of them had been bought by an American dealer um, who uh, had, as I said, hundreds of them and who sold them to various museums, especially in the US. And so um, the interesting thing is that uh, this article of 2003 15 years later, got a, a sequel, which was just, just published this summer. Well, it came out, uh, I think, last week in the Journal of African Arts. And I must confess, I got this copy yesterday. I haven't read the article. But um, the title is The Vigango Affair. As I said, Vigango is the indigenous name of these posts. The Enterprise of re Repatriating Mijikenda Memorial Figures to Kenya. So. Uh, I hope I'll be invited again to tell you about this article. Um, in other words, it's an ongoing issue because these posts um, were still being used in the 80s and 90s as a way to communicate uh, with the ancestors. And they were part of the religious life of the um, inhabitants there. So um, it's neither war booty nor archaeological material, but it's a kind of a living cultural heritage. Now then, um, let's move to the oldest uh, known sub-Saharan African culture. Last week, um, we talked about ancient Egypt, which of course has very stringent laws to protect its uh, archaeological heritage. And I mentioned that the show that's currently on view, Egypt's sunken cities, is uh, all the all the objects in that show come from Egyptian museums. So there's no question about uh, provenance or possible illegal um, export or looting. It's a different story for the artworks from the Nok culture. And uh, the Nok culture, there's a map here. It's kind of in the center of Nigeria. And um, there are two examples uh, that I have, give here. One is just a head, a fragment of a statue. It belongs to the Minneapolis Institute of Art and um, was acquired um, before I arrived there. And it shows a hole in the forehead that um, is the result of an illegal, um, illegal digging. So the people who um, looked for these artifacts in the soil and used uh, holes, etc., made that hole uh, unintentionally. And the head on the right, which is in fact a detail of an entire figure that has been discovered, is much more recent. It's the result of an archaeological excavation uh, done by a German team from the University of Frankfurt in collaboration with um, scholars from Nigeria. And um, they have been able to discover much more about Nok culture, which to this day still remains, remains a little mysterious. But the dates of uh, that culture have also been pushed back. Um, um, originally, it was thought that the Nok culture existed from around uh, 300 BCE, which means before Common Era, to 500 CE, Common Era. And now, uh, certainly, the, the kind of the, the peak of Nok culture is the dates that I give you here. And uh, 
It's a fascinating figure on the right. It has a shell on the forehead, um, and people, uh, the archaeolog archaeologists were able to identify which particular shell this is. It comes from the Atlantic Ocean, and, and it simply indicates uh, the trade networks at that time, probably shells, uh, even Atlantic Ocean shells were used as some form of currency, and so they ended up to be represented uh, in the middle of Nigeria, uh, many uh, centuries BCE. Um, he, the next picture gives you kind of the, uh, the difference between an illegal dig and an archaeological excavation, um, and, um, and you find these these holes on the left, you find them not only in many areas in Nigeria, but also in Mali and in other areas where there is a very rich underground. Whereas with archaeological excavations, uh, it's a scientific enterprise with measurements and careful um, manipulations of the objects, and of course one can learn much more about the culture in that way. Mm. Here on the left is uh, a figure that was considered as one of the masterpieces of um, African art at the Minneapolis Institute of Art when I arrived there. A huge uh, figure it was called the Seated Dignitary. And um, there were some suspicions about its authenticity. So uh, a few years ago, um, we did a CT scan with a medical doctor. It's uh, um, Dr. Geisels, Mark Geisels is well known in the field, started as a um, radiologist for human beings and then became a specialist of um, art, artifacts. He always tells that uh, they are much easier patients. And so we did a CT scan uh, at a hospital in Minneapolis and the result um, is visible on the left. Um, and so the the, 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 figure, the, the figure on the right with all these colors indicates the different densities of the clay, crystal density of the clay being used. And as you can see, there are at least five or six different types of clay used to make that figure. Uh, but the real giveaway is the, the, the coupe in the middle that shows uh, with the arrows that the head in fact has a whole part of it that's inside the figure and of course no ceramist uh, ceramicist would make a figure with clay inside so basically the object is a pastiche it consists of um, at least a dozen fragments some large some small that were put together and I show on purpose this uh, photograph on the left too, which um, are fragments at a looted site in Nok country, because there is even a trade in, in these fragments. These are very valuable for forgers who use them to make a new figure. And of course, if you do a thermoluminescence test that um, determines the age of an object, which was done on our uh, large seated dignitary, then you get an old age because the material being used is old. But uh, thanks to these CT scan this CT scan technology, uh, one can really look inside and even measure the density, as I said. So um, I um, deaccessioned this figure that I now call the cheated dignitary, and. Uh, but we kept it because it's a wonderful uh, educational material. There are also the, the Mark Geisel's made uh, kind of animated um, little films about the CT scan where one can really go in and out of the figure and uh, see what's happening. An another country with a very rich underground is Mali. And I have two maps here, uh, one showing uh, the, the Delta, uh, the, sorry, the Niger River that starts in, in Guinea on the, in the west and then ends up uh, in Nigeria, um, in the Niger Delta. But in the middle, inland, is the Niger Inland Delta, which is a very important uh, region 
um, basically between Bamako, which is the current capital of Mali, and Timbuktu, which is a, a fabled city uh, at the border of the Sahel and the Sahara. And this region um, is home to a very old city in West Africa, Djenne, um, which was built probably around 800 CE. But even before, um, there are traces of trade between co the coastal region and, and north of the Sahara. So this trans-Saharan trade has existed for a long time, but really became uh, important when Northern Africa um, was Islamized, which happened um, in, within a few decades after the death of uh, the Prophet Muhammad in the 7th century. And uh, the demand for gold increased tremendously, and uh, the, the various countries on, this, um, on the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf, the Gulf of Guinea, uh, had, had in the past and still have today some gold fields. In fact, one of the countries, Ghana, used to be called the Gold Coast during British colonialism. And so the kings of the Empire of Mali, which covers present-day Mali but extended to the um, western tip of Africa, including Senegal, which is just north of Guinea, the kings of Mali were really at the crossroads between the south and the north. And uh, as I said, gold came from the south, but then sold, salt came from the north, from the Sahara. And salt was often uh, even more valuable than gold. And so uh, on the right is a map made in uh, 1375, a Catalan map that shows a part of Africa um, and the coast of Spain. And the figure seated on a throne and holding um, a globe and a scepter made of gold with a crown is uh, King Mansa Musa of Mali, who lived more or less, that's wrong of course, sorry, that should be uh, 1337, 1280 to 1337, um, and who according to some current calculations, uh, could have been the richest man ever in history. Um, coming, far, uh, coming before the Rothschilds and the Rockefeller and even Bill Gates. And the reason he, one knows he was extremely rich is that in, um, at the beginning of the, fifth, the 14th century, in 1324 and 1325, he made a pilgrimage to Mecca, so he went on a Hajj. And that has been recorded by many Arab sources. And um, he had a procession of 60,000 people with hundreds, if not thousands, of animals, camels and horses that were all loaded with gold. And um, one of the pillars of Islam being um, to give to the poor, he was very generous with his gold. And in Cairo, where he stayed for um, some time, he gave out so much gold that the value of the gold crashed during his trip. And it took uh, 10 years for the gold price and the gold market to recover. So um, a very uh, important um, Empire, the Kingdom of Mali, and um, even after its demise, there were other smaller uh, kingdoms in that region, in the Niger Inland Delta and around Timbuktu. And on the right hand um, is a photograph of uh, looters who cover their faces, who uh, excavate illegally uh, these uh, statues from the that are called Jene. Jenny statues from after the city of Jenny. Um whereas on the left you see part, I mean, it's hard to imagine, but this is a detail of a 300 feet high escarpment, the so-called uh, falaise of Bandiagara, which is in, in Mali, which is home to the Dogon people. And the predecessors of the Dogon, uh, a, a people that no longer exists called the Telem, build these granaries and these uh, structures, some of which are um, uh, tombs, 
in the in the escarpment um, at, at various heights and due to the microclimate there um, many objects in wood have uh, survived for centuries and centuries some of them dating back to the 14th century and so um, for years if not decades objects would be looted from that uh, from Dogon villages um, and if and it's the Dogon people themselves who took the initiative to protect their cultural heritage and as a tourist it's now impossible to visit Dogon country unless you do it with a Dogon guide so um, I was lucky enough to do that a number of years ago of course Mali in 2012 uh, underwent a major change with the kind of temporary takeover of uh, uh, fundamental uh, fundamentalists uh, who kind of make travel in in that part of Mali no longer possible and we will I will also mention what they did to the cultural heritage at any rate um, Mali has um, produced major art that um, often has been exported illegally and um, a few years ago and that's the photo on the left a list was published of artworks that um, were in various museums and collections that had been stolen from the museum in in Bamako in the capital of Mali and so these are some examples of Jene statuary also ceramics that um, the museum in Mali had um, found and kept and that had been stolen from the museum and on the right is a much more recent um, alert a, a red list published by ICOM and Interpol ICOM stands for the International Council of Museums which has a specific branch called AFRICOM ICOM in Africa and the Interpol regularly publish lists of endangered cultural heritage from anywhere in the world. There's one for Iraq, I think there's one in the making or it has already been published about the cultural heritage of Syria, uh, often zones of war and as you know the cultural heritage or museums and sites are uh, systematically a casualty of war also. And so, um, but the kind of tragic is that uh, the fundamentalist Islamists who took over part of Mali for a number of years um, also threatened the libraries in cities like Jene and Timbuktu. These are family libraries that have existed for centuries and that have manuscripts dating back from the 16th, 17th century. Um, and um, they, the, the fundamentalists also destroyed um, mausoleums, uh, tombs of Sufi saints in Timbuktu, um, which uh, have been re rebuilt in the meantime, uh, thanks to UNESCO. So it's, it's just to put this in a wider perspective, cultural heritage in Africa is not only threatened by Western collectors or, or museums. Um, leaving Mali, um, one last example of kind of a archaeological heritage, and, and then we move into the war booty. Um, this is um, an obelisk, obelisk uh, from the kingdom of Aksum, um, which uh, there's a map of Ethiopia, so Aksum is here. Um, um, the next slide will be showing Lalibela, which is a region where there are uh, about 10 Christian churches hewn in, in rock. And, and this whole region here, Gondar, Lalibela, and then this Lake Tana, which has an island, is uh, full of Christian monasteries. And uh, Ethiopia is, is the first Christian country of Africa, the king um, is Anna the first converted to Christianity in around 350 CE so there's a long tradition of Christian art but first um, I wanted to mention this obelisk uh, that came from the Aksum kingdom and that um, was looted by um, Mussolini who as you know Italy invaded Ethiopia 
tried to make it into a colony. And in 1937, uh, as war booty, he, um, or the Italians, took the obelisk, which had fallen on the ground and was existed in several pieces, to Rome, where it, it was installed, uh, as you see on the left, in on one of the piazzas. And um, after the war, war um, already in 1947, uh, there was an agreement that Italy had signed to return that obelisk to Ethiopia. But then it took more than 50 years to actually happen. And Italy started to deinstall it in 2003. And then um, finally it moved to Ethiopia in 2005 and was reinstalled and unveiled in 2008. So uh, a, a long process, but it's now uh, back in Aksum, among other much smaller obelisks. And Aksum remained important in the history of Ethiopia, even under Christianity, because the Ethiopian emperors um, who, whose capitals were elsewhere would still go to Aksum uh, during their installation for, for, for their coronation ceremonies. So um, a culturally very significant place. So um, that is something that um, was repaired. Um, less happy is the, is the development of um, a war booty that is currently held at uh, VNA, the Victorian Albert Museum in London. Um, this royal dress and uh, gold crown, dating from the early uh, 19th century, were taken to London in 1868 during the capture of the capital of uh, one of the capitals of Emperor uh, Theodros II, who actually that at that capture committed suicide in order to avoid being captured by the British. And so um, this year marks the 150th anniversary of that uh, battle, and the VNA organized an exhibition with this treasure. Um, Ethiopia asked for the return after the exhibition, um, and uh, so far the VNA doesn't want to do that, but instead proposes a long-term loan. So we'll see how that develops um, in the coming um, years. And um, I mentioned the, the, the Christian art in Ethiopia. Here is uh, um, such a, a church that, as I said, is hewn into the rock, so you have to walk down stairs that are also in the rock to go down and enter the church. Um, and so when um, a few years ago the Minneapolis Institute of Art acquired the diptych that you see on the right, we, um, we wanted to make sure that it had not been looted from Ethiopia. Again, Ethiopia um, has undergone a number or has suffered a number of wars Wars uh, first with um, Eritrea, which became independent a few years ago, and then internally also with the region of Tigray, which has many monasteries. So there is a list, uh, kind of a fairly exhaustive list of inventories of monasteries and churches, and also a list of objects that are missing. Um, and uh, behind that is a French anthropologist, Jacques Mercier, who has been working with um, churches and monasteries in Ethiopia for decades now. And here's a photo from 1998 where he, he makes an inventory of his, this cultural heritage. So um, the diptych, um, in fact, had been in Italian family uh, since the 1960s. So we went ahead with the acquisition. Um, much better known, of course, is um, the Kingdom of Benin. Um, so it's a little confusing, but there is a kingdom called Benin, which is in the current state or country of Nigeria. And next to Nigeria, to its west, is a country that is called Benin. And that has a kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Abome. And it's um, that kingdom of Abone in the country of Benin that um, 
is currently debated in France, and I will, men I will take you there in a minute. But here now we are in Nigeria with the famous Kingdom of Benin, described by this uh, Dutch author, Alfred Dapper, who never left Amsterdam, basically, but uh, compiled all the testimonies of travelers and wrote the first very exhaustive description of all the parts of Africa that were known in the uh, golden, um, golden age of the Netherlands, the mid-17th century. And um, there are also this, um, these beautiful engravings in or prints in the book. And this is a procession um, in, the, in Benin City um, with the king and one sees part of his palace and you see the birds on top of the roof. And so Benin, um, again, had been a very uh, wealthy kingdom that started trading with the uh, Portuguese and then um, later on with the Brits. Um, part of its richness came, uh, well, there was trade in, in pepper and other commodities, but also in slaves. So um, the Portuguese in the 16th century traded with copper and uh, bronze, and this was then, this raw material was transformed in uh, the famous Benin bronzes, which are heads, uh, bells, uh, plaques, in other words, fairly two-dimensional uh, artworks. And then also part of the regalia in, Benin, in the Benin kingdom are uh, engraved tusks which basically are historical records. And one of the specialists um, was somebody from the University of um, California, San Diego, uh, Barbara Blackman, who passed away, I think, this year, who, uh, whose specialty was the deciphering of these tusks. And uh, she did it also for the tusk that is at, at Mia, and so she uh, was able to recount the history that is recorded, which is basically, for this particular example, the rivalry between two generals um, and, and their role in, in the early 18th century. So, this is a memorial head and a carved tusk that are, um, that belong, well, that are in the collection of the Minneapolis Institute of Art, acquired before I got there. Um, here, is probably one the oldest known photograph of a royal shrine. So the this is inside the palace. Um, this is a photo from 1891, and it shows these heads of previous kings with the tusk put on top of the head. And the head always has an opening, and often the tusk would either fit in the head or just rest on top of it. Um, and it symbolically represented the connection of uh, the present king with his ancestors. It was kind of an axis, axis mundi, connecting the world of the living with the world of the spirits of the ancestors. And so the, the British had trade relationships with the kingdom of Benin, that was inland. Um, but wanted more control and at one point um, said that they would visit the king again. But that was during a period that there were kind of uh, sacred ceremonies that took place in Benin City. And so the Brits were told not to visit during that period. Uh, they went anyway with a small company and all the members of that company were killed because they were not supposed to be uh, or to come to Benin City at that time. And as a result, um, the Brits organized a major military campaign called the Punitive Expedition, which is, of course, a euphemism. Um, they shelled the city of Benin for uh, more than a week, kind of destroyed most of it, um, and when they finally entered, they looted the palace, which was a repository of uh, regalia, uh, 
these heads, all these tusks, all kinds of um, ritual objects. You see a leopard here, which is a, a, a hewer, a vessel, uh, and they always came in pairs, and they were used for washing hands in certain court ceremonies. So more than uh, 1,500 objects were taken from the palace and shipped to Britain, uh, many of which are uh, currently at the British Museum, many of which are at other museums in Europe, and uh, some of which were given to heads of state by Queen Victoria, and others uh, ended up on the market. So, um, again, in 1997, for the centennial of this um, um, looting and, and kind of destruction of the palace, uh, the Nigerian uh, kingdom, king of Benin, so the kingdom has been restored, but it's kind of a ceremonial title now. Uh, the king of Benin, uh, the current king of Benin, uh, asked for a return of those treasures, and um, it's certainly a debate that hasn't closed. And one of the problems, but I will talk about um, museums in Africa in a minute, one of the problems is that um, there is no infrastructure in, in Nigeria to repatriate or to show or enhouse these thousands of objects, which is not a reason not to think about restitution at all. But um, here is uh, an example of uh, the return of two pieces by a private uh, person. Uh, Mr. Walker, Dr. Walker is the grandson of one of the participants in the 1897 punitive expedition. And uh, in 2014, he returned uh, a, a bronze bird and a bell to, uh, to the kingdom. And he's seen here with uh, one of the princes. Now, this bird, you, you already, you remember the, so, the, the birds on as finials of roofs, so um, they are called prophecy birds, and in fact this is uh, broken. Uh, the bird would have had a little staff underneath to be held in hand, and um, these birds are kind of iconic in um, Benin royal art because according to the history, uh, oral history, in the 16th century um, a Benin king waged a war against uh, his neighbor and the prophecy bird um, announced that the, the king would lose the battle and uh, he, he wasn't very happy with that prophecy so he shot the bird or had the bird shot and did win the war and since then uh, the king ordered this kind of bird to be produced in brass to remember um, how, how more powerful the kings are than any prophecy. So uh, this is another happy ending, but on a very small scale, as you can imagine, uh, if more than 1,500 objects were taken from the palace. So now um, this will be the, the final example. We come to the kingdom of Dahomey or Dahomey, uh, which is in the country of Benin. Um, at the end of the 19th century, in 1892, the French uh, marched into the capital of that kingdom in Abomey and uh, defeated the, the last king, Béhanzin, and uh, took a number of regalia that were in the palace, including these three objects that uh, represent, in fact, three kings. Um, and one even knows the, the sculptor, because um, often royal artists in, in, in many kingdoms, including in the kingdom of Dalmay, were known. And oral history has uh, a memory of, of those artists so, who, who produced in the early and mid 19th century. Uh, his name was uh, Sosa Dede. And so uh, these sculptures were made at different periods, either by uh, Sosa Dede himself or by his workshop after his death. On the left is the oldest one, and it shows um, King Lele, 
was one of the uh, Dahomey kings, as half human, half lion. Um, all these are made in wood. In the middle is um, this his successor, King Gezo, who is half man, half, half bird. And on the right is King Behanzin, the last one, who was uh, vanquished by the French, half shark, half man. Very important sculptures uh, of, of the royal dynasty that were in the palace of Behanzin. And it's this particular treasure, these three sculptures plus other regalia, that um, kind of formed the impetus of, for uh, uh, President Emmanuel Macron to, or, to um, order this report, because uh, the president of the country of Benin had asked for their return. Um, and so I juxtapose here uh, one of the regalia on the right, uh, which is the throne of the last king. Um, it's, there's no scale on this photograph, but it's uh, two meters, so which is more than six feet, six and a half feet high. And the king would sit on that throne a few times a year during particular ceremonies where he would distribute um, gifts to his retainers and to the people who were visiting him. Uh, uh, an important icon which is currently uh, on view at the Musée du Cabranli in Paris. And of course, on not the same thing on the left, uh, a um, engraving dating from 1892 uh, showing from the French perspective the entry of the French and the French flag into Abomey, the capital of the Dahomey Kingdom, and how the citizens of uh, Abomey were so happy to welcome the French. So, uh, not quite. Now, often the argument, there are two arguments uh, that are often given against restitution, against returning art uh, or some artworks to the countries of origin. One is that, um, in fact, what the West has done is to save these objects that would have disappeared or, or decayed or, or disintegrated. Well, um, it, I mean, if we go back to uh, Mali, for instance, in, in these uh, stone st structures that you see on the left, uh, the, the Telem people and then the Dogon who came after them uh, were able to preserve artworks for, for six, seven hundred years. So the argument that the West is there to save African art is, is certainly not always true, or often not. And, uh, of course, if one speaks of royal art, uh, that too had been <coughs> kept for, for centuries in, in palaces. And the second argument is that there are no museums in Africa, so where, where should it go to? Um, that's why I show, it's maybe not very clear, I show you a map of the country Benin with these little dots that show museums. And so, Everything that's an M is a museum. The yellow M's are public museums and the red M's private ones. And then, so for instance, there are a number of museums along the coast, uh, from Porto Novo in the east to uh, Wada in, in the west, uh, Cotonou, at, which is the capital, um, and then inland, uh, lots of museums. And then the P's are projects for museums, again, public projects and private projects. This map dates from 2008, so uh, I'm sorry that I, I don't have updated information about what happened over the last 10 years. But this, at any rate, gives you an idea of the extent of museums in, in at least this African country. The same is true uh, for Nigeria, which has an extensive network of museums. Um, Mali has a very important museum in Bamako, um, which uh, was built with the French and um, lost some objects, but then uh, improved its uh, security. Senegal is building a new museum of uh, civilizations that is about to open. 
There are museums in Kenya, South Africa, Ethiopia, and many other countries. So, um, in my opinion, one of the solutions is for Western museums, European and North American, to kind of work together with, to collaborate with local African museums in terms of training, uh, financial support, um, infrastructure, etc., so that certain pieces can indeed be returned and be kept safely and shown to descendants of their makers. Um, finally, here, uh, as I said, ICOM, the, in the International Council of Museums, and Interpol and other international organizations work hard to make um, illegal export and digging and export, excavation and export of trade of African cultural heritage punishable and, and they regularly produce these lists so that um, customs can identify what is um, what is illegal and so there's this list uh, that involves um, I think eight different types of art uh, here they're concentrating concentrating on Western Africa um, but as I started the talk with um, the memorial post, so there are also problems in, in Eastern Africa, in Kenya. Finally, um, the only archaeological object in your collection from Africa, which is not on the red list, um, so that's good news. Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful uh, sculpture, actually. It's, um, it, it's a mysterious type of object that comes from the region of Guinea, uh, border with Liberia, that is found underground. It's made of stone, and one thinks it dates from the 14th to 16th century. Um, but the interesting thing is that, um, and, and it's called a pomdo, um, and these objects that are found by, by local people often are then reused, are venerated as ancestors. ancestors. So the current uh, people in that region, the Kisi, see them as manifest manifestations of their ancestors and kind of venerate them, or use them uh, in divination procedures. In other words, the link with the ancestor will allow the diviner to um, either see in the future or, or find some hidden hidden causes for some misfortune in the past. And this is a very uh, interesting example, um, because, first because of its size, it's about 15 inches high and usually they're much smaller. And then uh, it's hard to see, but this is a figure, a seated figure who's on an animal. Um, usually the iconography shows an elephant, but uh, there's no tusk uh, and there are no there's no uh, trump here, so this may be a leopard, which is a royal animal, and is sometimes depicted in uh, this kissy art. And then on the head is kind of a round structure that may be a turban. Um, and so I sent a picture of this to the specialist of um, these stone figures, Frederick Lamp, who um, last year wrote a book called Ancestors in Search of Descendants. And so um, he, he thought it was a, a wonderful example that he didn't know and he would have included it in his book. That's my story. Thank you very much. What about the value given to cultural heritage to an invader who wishes to destroy it? One begins with uh, the Red Guards in China and goes through Syria and all of the Middle East. Um, what do you do about that? Can you repeat the question? Because a community values their artwork, an invader wants to destroy it. Right. 
What, what oh, do you, you mean when it's not looted? When it's, no. But destroyed, yes. And Destruction, uh, removing the, um, the heritage of the people you're invading. Absolutely. It's and, going and, on now. Right, that happens, uh, uh, thank you for the question, that happens uh, in lots of places. And of course, uh, the example I gave from Africa is what happened in Mali, in the city of Timbuktu, and to a certain extent in Jenin between 2012 and 2014. Um, there it was based the, on, on religious grounds. The um, fundamentalists don't agree with certain forms of Islam, like Sufism, um, and the veneration of Sufi saints, who are at the origin of, of brotherhoods. And, and Sufism is um, the more mystical branch of Islam. And so the fundamentalists see that as uh, haram, and therefore indeed destroy local cultural heritage. Yes, but often um, one sees that also in Syria um, with ISIS, there's not only destruction of cultural heritage, but also um, looting in order to generate money. Uh, lots of objects from Syrian museums end up on the market um, in order to benefit uh, the, the invaders. Yes. Um, I'm all for the repatriation of, of objects from American and European collections if and when African nations are able to properly secure them and preserve them and, and make sure that they won't uh, walk back out of the uh, of the country, out of the museum. We know from Nigeria, uh, the Nigerian Museum, which was established by the British, that hundreds and hundreds of really marvelous works of arts, works of art, were uh, <clears throat> sold from the museum by guards and other um, employees of the museum in the. 80s, 90s, and into the teens. Mm. Uh, we know that the museum in Cote d'Ivoire, established by Olas, was looted, and most of those objects ended up in France. You showed pictures of objects that were looted out of the museum in um, Bamako, in Mali. So, as far as I'm aware, there is no African country or single museum that can prove its ability to secure and preserve any objects that might be returned. So even though uh, in principle, yes, this stuff should go, some of it should go back to Africa, I'm against sending it back unless and until it can be carefully conserved. I, I agree with you, and that's a very reasonable request. Um, I do think that things are changing um, in Africa, but uh, a lot of work still has to be done. And, and there are indeed examples of, um, I mean, um, of artworks that appear on the market um, a week after they had been returned. One famous or infamous example is after the independence of the so-called Belgian Congo in 1960, uh, the Museum of Tervuren gave, I think, 30 objects to the then Museum of Leopoldville, and which which um, appeared on the market and ended up in private collections. But um, I don't think that that can be the final answer to not return or even think about restitution. And I know that. That's not your argument. Um, I think um, it, it simply underscores how important it is to, uh, to cr help create these museums and their security and infrastructure. And um, because um, more and more it becomes obvious that many um, in many African countries, people, and especially youth, are very interested in, in African art, in traditional African art. There's, of course, a thriving uh, scene of contemporary African art, but um, if one reads uh, certain testimonies, it's clear that young people want to know what 
what their roots are and what cultures they come from and what kind of art were made in the decades or even centuries before, uh, before the, the current era. So I think it's kind of a, a moral obligation for um, Western countries to make that encounter, art, encounter with art possible. But again, not uh, at the risk of the art itself. Uh, should we worry? Is there reason to worry that once this restitution movement begins, it's seized upon by local politicians in these countries as a way to build up their power and say, "Look how strong I am! I'm going against the white man. I'm going against Europe." And it leads to more confrontation rather than compromise and working together with uh, our countries and their countries. Well, I, I would need a divination procedure to answer your question, but I, I think you're you're right. Of course, that that danger absolutely exists, and so uh, again, um, this debate has kind of flared up again after the uh, Star Savoie report. Um, and so there have been many quick reactions. For instance, the Minister of Culture of Senegal uh, recently, uh, last week, said that if there were 10,000 objects of Senegal in France, all 10,000 should be returned. Um, and that's kind of a first kind of gut reaction, but that's neither realistic nor, nor just because Certainly not all those 10,000 objects have been looted, etc. And um, again, there's always the danger that politicians use art to increase their power. Uh, that also happens in the West. And um, the, reason why, the reason that most of the Bruegels are no longer in Belgium but in Vienna is because the Habsburgs wanted to show um, how, um, what a good taste they had and how powerful they were. So that's certainly true. And so there are all kinds of things one should be careful. And again, uh, I don't think that the report warrants uh, or that thinking about this issue warrants a wholesome return of, of Af all African pieces. So, yeah. <coughs> What, what um, the, the UN I can think of immediately as a presiding moral center. I mean, there must be laws, there must be rules, there must, sorry, oh. What, what mechanisms do we have to protect, to protect this exchange, which is gonna happen? Sure, well, um, I mean, I mentioned a, a few things, uh, including UNESCO, which of course depends on, on the, or is part of the UN, and I think the US no longer supports UNESCO. Um, but um, UNESCO has been, by, UNESCO is kind of the cultural organization of the UN. Uh, they have been responsible, for instance, for the restoration of these Sufi tombs in, in Timbuktu. Um, that reopened uh, in 2014. Um, and then um, institutions like the International Council of Museums and AFRICOM and Interpol all work together and maybe a new organization has to be created to kind of supervise that whole, that whole um, dialogue because really it's a matter of starting a conversation that um, includes a more fair and, and, and global exchange. That, that's, I think, the takeaway of this whole uh, debate currently. I don't mean it to be a naive suggestion, but there are ways to reproduce and make available both physically and virtually any object now to the point that you couldn't tell them apart without, you know, digging a hole in them and put them in a spectroscopy. Right. So, um, is there any thought about how to handle the fact that these objects can be in more than one place, essentially, and and they can be preserved also? I mean, you can destroy the, you can either destroy the copy or you can have a virtual copy that can't be destroyed in any case. 
Right. Uh, thank you. Yes, that's a in is interesting uh, path. Now, the uh, Sar Savoir report also recommends um, making a digital in inventory of all objects held in European, or in this case, French museums. So, digitization is, is certainly a first step to make more available uh, these, these artworks. Um, making copies and showing them in museums. Um, I know that, um, that that happens a lot in China. Um, and it probably depends on one's philosophy, but... Um, well, but also we have caves. We have right, cave right, the Lascaux. Paper. Yes, you're right. And my, you know, microscopic detail, and you go and it looks exactly like that, and you're not preserving the, the original one. Right. The experience for the visitor is identical. Uh, yes, no, you're right. M and maybe then uh, what African museums would suggest is that they keep the original and that we have copies here. Well, that would be a great solution. But uh, yes, it, I mean, again, that is something to. Pardon me? Right, right, right. I know that there are many ways to, um, to make copies, yes. Um, how far back do you go when you define looting? You, know, you bought the diptych from Ethiopia, which was the hands of an Italian family from the 1960s, but you go further back. Yep. Who knows? I mean, the victory of Samotras, you know, I mean, it was bought, but purchased, but, you know, nowadays it could have been considered like it was looted, too. I mean. Right. No, that's a good question. And um, the American Museum. The American Association of Museum Directors, um, I think in 29, uh, maybe um, Larry Feinberg would be able to um, refresh my memory, adopted um, kind of a convention or a policy to recognize 1970 as kind of a benchmark date. And 1970 is uh, when um, UNESCO um, agreed to a convention, and I'm reading the title, on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property. And so uh, the, the goal was to reinforce international um, solidarity in the fight against the traffic of cultural property. So that was the Convention of the UNESCO of 1970, and for items like Ethiopian diptychs, but also um, other forms of art, museums that are threatened, uh, and museums take that, American museums tend to take that date. And so everything that um, has left the country after 1970 without proper paperwork. Uh, would not be considered for acquisition. Now, that is in cases where the origin is unclear and is potentially looted. Um, different is um, the story of documented uh, acts of war, like the um, looting of uh, and destruction of the palace of the city of Benin. There, and there's another convention, the Convention of Geneva, which is much older, that says that, that stipulates that uh, war booty should go back to the country of origin. So, I don't know if, if you, you have any other addition to, yeah. Um, can I just ask a relatively naive uh, but broader conceptual question? Um, it always has bothered me when referring to non-Western, you know, these are interesting nouns, material, uh, in museums that we don't really distinguish between a Western version of what art is versus what if it exists as a concept in these other cultures. So in a way, whether or not the objects are preserved in museums, it seems to me in itself already a deeply Western presumption. Um, so 
for example, and I'm just let's play a science fiction game if you're talking about a particular culture where art as a concept doesn't exist, and these objects, artifacts, however you want to call them, actually were never meant to be preserved or fetishized in this way, but rather were meant to be used, let's say ritualistically, maybe even destroyed, then doesn't that kind of complicate this whole I mean, universal presumption that we need to preserve these objects somehow or another and encase them. Um, so, you know, I just wonder whether or not anybody ever attempts to engage in, I mean, it's a very complicated history, but it seems like the Western version of what a museum is, and what an art object is, and what the preservation of objects means isn't necessarily something that all cultures share. Absolutely. And, and of course, that, that opens up the debate to how to define art, um, which is a recent Western in invention, uh, art for art's sake. I, I agree. And so um, probably most of the objects on view in, in, in an encyclopedic museum, even Western objects, were used in, in kind of a religious context. Um, all the art from the Middle Ages, uh, well, most of it, because then you also have secular art, and that was mainly to um, honor and aggrandize the elite. And so there are both types of art have come out of Africa and have given examples of both. Um, I think that even for countries whose cultures did not have uh, traditionally a sense or, or a, a concept of art. Um, I think that today in 2018 um, with the globalization of images and of uh, cultural identity and of art and, and so on and so forth, I think that uh, it does make sense to have museums that either you can call it fetishized or uh, celebrate um, objects made by past artists. But um, that doesn't yeah, pre prevent us or museums in Africa to think about uh, what, what does it mean to have objects that were used in rituals, what does it mean to have them in a case where also people who were not initiated in that particular ceremony can now see them. Um, and, and, and I mean, that's a question that also pertains to Native American art. Certain objects will not be shown in, in museums because of their sacredness. So that, that certainly exists. Um, and I've been focusing in this talk on returning African artworks to African museums, but uh, there's also in, in Africa the sense that their museums shouldn't show only African art. And uh, the new museum in, in Senegal that is going to be opened uh, wants to show, uh, and I don't know how far those plans are, wants to show highlights of art made in China and in, uh, in, in Central America, etc. So there's certainly, that's something that museums can um, stimulate, and not only <coughs> Western museums, but anywhere, kind of a sense of um, hu hum humanity's quest for wonder and beauty. And I think that museums anywhere have a, a, a function to do that. Can we steal your phrase from you for our it's next not copyrighted. Yes. mission statement? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we probably should conclude. Thank you so much, Jan Ludwig. Thank you. Thank you.